Welcome to the 2022 STS Resident Trainee Symposium. I'm Elizabeth Dexter. Uh, Dr. Faze Bora and I, who is the chair of this uh, resident symposium, would like to welcome you as we give our program on transitioning from training to uh, practicing physician. Uh, I'd like to thank the STS and Dr. Elizabeth David and Dr. Bora for allowing me to talk to you today. And what I'm gonna be talking about is when, how, and what job to look for. Um, I do receive royalties from up to date, but the content of today's talk is not related. So as you're getting done with your training, when, how, and what are you going to be excitedly looking for a new job opportunity as a practicing physician? Um, I'd also like to remind you that there will be a survey uh, loaded up after the uh, symposium is done for you to fill out. And also there will be information in the chat about how you can sign up to be a resident, a fellow or a medical student participant in the STS. Um, so one of the things that you wanna consider and all of us have different circumstances is what kind of practice you'd like to be in. Would you like to be more of your own uh, person and decide on your own schedule? Or would you rather be hospital employed, uh, be in an academic practice and have partners such as uh, Dr. Evil here? Um, all of us are considering whether we wanna participate in cardiac, thoracic, both. And some of you will maybe even consider doing some vascular work in addition. In today's medical environment, uh, Practicing all three may mean that you're gonna be in a more rural area or in a more non-academic setting in a large private practice group. And if you wanna participate in something such as bench or clinical practice research, that may mean a more academic setting. Um, so if you decide to subspecialize, which many of you are considering, congenital heart failure, transplant surgery, irritable or endovascular surgery, uh, these will actually narrow your framework for looking for a job uh, because these jobs, of course, are so uh, much more subspecialized that there are fewer physicians needed in these areas. Geographic preference. You want to live in a place that's pleasant for you and that has the climate that you want. Um, do you want to live in an urban setting, a more suburban setting, or a rural setting? And I'd like to mention that as you look at my slides, you'll see intersperse some pictures of our recent Olympians. These are people that have dedicated hard work and effort into their uh, reaching their goals as all of you have. So I just wanted to honor them and honor you. A commute is something that a practice may require for you. Sometimes practices require that you go to different locations on different days of the week or even for weeks at a time. And this is something that you're gonna wanna look at. Are you someone that wants to take public transportation so that you can read or contemplate your day as you're traveling along? Or would you like to live in a place or be in a position where you can maybe bicycle to work several times a week? As you're all getting done with training, thankfully you'll have more time to enjoy things outside of the hospital. And you wanna make sure that you're able to be in a place where you can participate in your known hobbies and outside activities. Family is a big consideration, of course, and you'll want to consider how close you want to be with your family and whether you need your family to help with things such as childcare issues. If you have children, uh, you'll want to look at school systems. And if you have special needs children, that, of course, may impact what resources available in the community. So how do you start looking for job positions? Um, although printed journals are becoming less and less common, um, society websites and newsletters often will have job listing sites, and there are also places such as LinkedIn that you can take advantage of. Headhunters are not as commonly used for first job opportunities, but they are available to you. Uh, one thing you'll want to do, and this is uh, just some pictures of my uh, faculty and mentors, is you will want to reach out to your faculty. Um, although they may be torturing you during training, they're pretty savvy about different job situations and positions and what things that they think would be a good fit for you. So as you look at your uh, job opportunities, you'll wanna reach out to them. Additionally, they often have networking abilities and can reach out to colleagues and see if 
a place where you know you might want to be to practice has a job opportunity available. Take all advantage of networking, conferences, seminars, professional society meetings, seminars such as this. Uh, the nice thing about the seminars is that you can meet people and you can get to know them and find some areas of common interest. One thing of this pandemic that's come out is that we're now all more used to virtual meetings. And so you can connect with people across the globe or across the country that may not have been as possible before. If you happen to know a practice or a surgeon that you might wanna join, you can reach out as a first touch with a phone call. If it's something that you don't know, a formal letter or an email with an updated CV attached is something that you can do. Uh, reaching out on social media such as LinkedIn is probably okay, but other areas such as Twitter may be something that you may want to avoid, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that later. As far as the curriculum vitae, you want to include all of these usual things, and all of you have definitely built a curriculum vitae to get as far as you have at this point. Um, one thing I want to mention is when you list your references, uh, I would confirm with your references that they're okay being listed and so that they know that they may be contact to hear about your progress. Certainly, if you have special interests such as global medicine, that's something to put on your CV. When would you like to contact places? Again, if you happen to know a practice that you want to join or surgeons in that practice, it's never too soon to just reach out. If you're generically searching for an opportunity, I recommend that you reach out to them first, even 12 to 15 months prior to finishing your training. And although this sounds very early and you might not have started your training very much, as particularly if you're in a traditional two-year training program, keep in mind that it does take time to onboard a new physician and that even a first contact early will be helpful. If you happen not to hear from a practice or a potential partner after your first contact, you might want to send a follow-up in one to two months. If you get invited to an interview, try to respond as soon as possible. We all know that you're busy with your training, but to set up possible dates for interviews, whether in person or virtually, is helpful for the administrative assistants and everybody has busy schedules, so this would be helpful. If you have certain travel requests, if you're going in person, again, uh, notify the person in charge of organizing the interview as soon as you can. Some first interview do's and don'ts. Do listen to get an overall view of the position. You'll wanna find out what role you would fill in the, in the practice, or if you wanna be in a hospital employment situation. You might want to find out the percentages of clinical research, administrative, and teaching commitments. And as you go around the hospital or the practice, you'll want to take note of the resource allocations from the hospital and the departments. If you're going to have an administrative assistant, advanced practice practitioners, how OR time is allocated, and what clinic staff are allocated to you. Keep an open mind, make eye contact, dress appropriately, but most of all, be yourself. This is sort of a courtship dance between you and a new potential employer. And so not, neither of you wants to be fooled with wool over your eyes by being someone that you're not or committing to something that you're not interested in. Some things that you don't want to do during a first interview are ask immediately about things such as salary, vacation, or benefits. Um, unless you're asked about how you happen to be exposed to different methods or practice plans, you don't want to make comparisons out loud, such as we always do it this way where I've been. Um, you never want to be impolite to any ancillary staff or personnel that you come across, such as administrative assistants, even janitors, uh, cleaning in the hospital, or food servers, as if you're with someone who you're interviewing with, they're going to take note of your behavior. Um, don't voice displeasure about their travel arrangements or accommodations. And one thing I recommend against is making demands such as, I can't work without such and such piece of equipment, at least in the first interview. If you get invited for a second or third interview, um, don't go unless you're interested in the job because you don't wanna waste your time, energy, 
or financial circumstances, as well as out of the potential practice. If you are interested, go, and now's the time to ask a little bit more detailed question, such as, who are you going to report to and how are you gonna be evaluated? You might wanna ask about your compensation and reimbursement and things such as how call schedules work, how new referrals come into the practice and how they're going to market your joining the practice. Benefits are something always to find out about. At a second or third interview, you may be interested in bringing a significant other and they may wanna bring you on a neighborhood tour so that you can see what the community has to offer particularly things such as school systems. If they haven't reached out to your references at this point and you're interested in the practice, you may ask your references to reach out to them on your behalf. You'll wanna send a thank you letter or email soon after your visit and list the benefits of the opportunity that you saw. You'll wanna state your interest in the opportunity and why or why it wouldn't be a good fit for you. Uh, if you happen to have a good rapport with the interview place, but you don't think it's the best fit for you, uh, you might wanna consider recommending a fellow applicant that you think would be a good fit for the practice. Um, I'm sure that as you all go through your exciting time of transitioning into finding a new job, uh, you're gonna do well. And this is just a picture of my excellent partners who I've had a great time with. Um, I'd welcome any questions. I can start off with a question, uh, Betsy, for you. Uh, um, when you're looking for a job, um, w how do you rate the importance of your report or your primary uh, mentor in the grand scheme of all of uh, this? I'm sorry, Faze, I couldn't quite hear you there. Um, in terms of the factors uh, that are important for your first job, how would you also rate um, your primary senior partner or your mentor who's going to have your back for the next one, two or three years as you start your practice? And what are the things you should be looking for to make sure that you would have a supportive environment? Yeah, I definitely think this is, is very important, especially as you're all starting your careers. Um, having a, not a good first uh, senior partner or mentor can really um, impact how your career goes. There are always curves in the road, uh, but you want to make sure, as you said, that there is someone that has your back and that they're not looking just for what you can provide for them, such as a new employee that they can hire and do a lot of the grunt work, but that they actually have your best interests for your future career in mind. Um, I think this is one of the preeminent factors, as you've mentioned, for sure. And, you know, one thing that's challenging, I think, as we all go through interviews and we know it, is that we're all on our best behavior as we interview. So some of it is a gut feeling that you get as you go through interviewing. Um, and sometimes it's even reaching out to past uh, mentees that this person has had and and seeing what their impression is of this person or previous employees that have left um i think actually to keep on time I'm going to move us along. So I'm going to introduce you as the next speaker. Um, Dr. Faze Bohr is actually the chair of this STS Red Symposium Planning Task Force. And I'd like to thank him for allowing me to participate. He's also the chief of thoracic surgery and thoracic oncology and associate program director of general surgery at the new Vance Health System in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, he's going to be speaking on negotiating a contract, what you need to know. Thanks, Faze. Uh, thank you very much, Betsy, and uh, thank you to the entire team, uh, Beth, Betsy, uh, Elizabeth, and uh, the rest of the crew. 
there's a lot of work that um, went uh, to create the symposium for you guys, and we're delighted you're here. So with that, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, so um, once once you've decided that this is a job for you, uh, the next step really is to uh, to negotiate the terms and um, what we call as your employment contract. And I think there are a few uh, important things that you need to know. I, I've uh, I probably seen about 50 such contracts from my prior residents and fellows, and I continue to guide it uh, and advise them. Um, so um, these are some of the key features that you need to be uh, familiar with in terms of your contract. So obviously salary, we'll talk a little bit about this, uh, uh, the duration of your contract, non-compete uh, clauses, which I'll discuss, um, uh, the routine benefits, uh, termination clauses are very important, and it's important that you understand how these work. Uh, malpractice coverage, again, very important. And then some of the other incentives that most uh, employers will throw at you um, and um, what you need to know. So uh, in terms of the salary, again, there's a really wide range uh, of salary from what I can currently glean the current standards for your first salary range from 350 in highly uh, competitive markets all the way up to 600 if you're doing cardiac surgery, perhaps in a rural environment that's underserved and where they haven't been able to recruit surgeons. So wide range, but somewhere in between, I think is where your offer should lie. It is generally higher in uh, private practice and in rural settings, as I've suggested. It's important to know that you can probably negotiate a little bit of an increase, particularly if you're on the lower end of the uh, of the spectrum. So keep that in mind. And it's important to understand what the expectations are for your compensation. Ideally, it should be guaranteed for the duration of your contract. It may not be guaranteed for the entire duration. It may be guaranteed for one or two years. And then there's an RVU expectation beyond that. So understanding what that RVU expectation is, I think um, is important. Uh, the talk is short and I can't go into details, but happy to speak to you guys after this if you would like. Um, uh, in terms of the duration, my strong suggestion is to try and get at least three years of a guaranteed salary. You may not be able to achieve that. At a minimum, I think two years of uh, guaranteed compensation uh, is critical. Um, uh, anything less than that, a one-year guarantee I look at as a red flag, and you have to be fairly careful about taking such positions, particularly if there has been a track record at that institution where folks haven't stayed um, uh, beyond one or two years. Um, also be aware of certain uh, termination clauses that are inserted within the contract where although the duration of the contract is three years, for instance, there is a 90 day out on both sides without, um, without cause. So that in essence reduces your contract to a 90 day contract. So be uh, aware and cognizant of that and make sure that that clause only kicks in at least after one or two years and not immediately. Um, it is uh, important to understand the non-compete clauses that I've seen pretty much universally now in uh, almost all employment agreements uh, with very few exceptions. It's generally hard to negotiate it out completely, particularly in your first job. However, you need to look at this and you might be able to soften some of the language around it. Now, generally, uh, the non-competes last for one or two years, depending on the state. Uh, the radius, um, uh, again, varies. It's about one mile in Manhattan, for instance, and 50 miles in other rural communities. So understand the geography of where you're going to be and uh, the impact that this may have if you were to leave your job after uh, or during your contract. So understanding that is important. Also understand from where exactly the, the 
uh, the radius is enforced? Is it from every single facility? Take a large health system um, uh, that has maybe 15 hospitals all throughout a state. Are you going to be blocked from the entire state? Or is it going to be from the institution where you or the hospital where you spend the bulk of your time? So understand all of this so you can make the right decision. Um, uh, the benefits um, are typically fairly standard. Um, you're going to have um, uh, a retirement plan, either a 403B or a uh, 401K, depending on if you join a nonprofit or a for-profit organization. Fairly similar. Um, most employers will match this from one to three percent. There is a vesting period of one to three years. Again, these are fairly standard, not much that you can do to negotiate here, but understanding it is important. Um, you might be able to do an additional pre-tax contribution. Um, I'm gonna let Sinu uh, talk a little bit more about this. Um, and then the usual sort of standard medical and dental insurance. I don't think there's much there that you can, um, you can negotiate. Now, this I think is important, uh, termination clauses. So um, you've got to uh, understand what the verbiage is in your contract for termination for cause. Um, uh, but generally, um, this has to be some sort of egregious event, such as you lost your license or, um, or you've been convicted of a felony, you know, what have you. So this has to be fairly egregious. Usually there should be a 30-day cure period where you get notice and you have an opportunity to cure before termination. Now, the other clause that's almost always thrown in is a termination without cause. And as I said, make sure that this is there at least after two years, because if it's there from the outset, then in essence, you don't really have a contract of any duration. It's, uh, it's the duration of, um, of the termination clause. Um, I would try and negotiate this to be at least 120 days, so four months, because if, you, uh, if you're asked to leave, you need at least four months to be able to find another job. So I think two or three months is short. Try and negotiate this to four months or even longer. And um, I've seen uh, severance pay now uh, be more and more acceptable if you're terminated without cause by the hospital. So I would certainly ask about this. And I think most employers are uh, considering this more favorably now, particularly in the last couple of years. So uh, severance could be six months of your salary, um, three months, six months uh, or longer, uh, generally speaking. Um, it's key to understand that the malpractice that you get from your institution has a tail. Uh, again, I won't go into the details of a claims made or an occurrence, but uh, the bottom line is that if you leave your institution, you are covered for all actions uh, and for all malpractice claims that could follow you after you leave the institution, but, but, but the work was done at your prior institution. So that's called a tail. It is critical that your malpractice have a tail. If you, if, if you're, um, uh, if you're moving to another job, you don't have a tail, you're going to have to buy a tail that can be very, very expensive in the order of several hundred thousand dollars. So keep that in mind. Um, most institutions will give you a sign-on bonus. Um, uh, the range is variable. There is always a relocation uh, compensation. Again, the range is variable. Um, uh, I won't uh, discuss numbers here, but happy to talk to you guys about it. Understand that everything is taxable. So about 40% of what, what is written down for you will go in taxes between 30 and 40%. So keep that in mind. Um, and then lastly, um, is it helpful to have an attorney? I think um, my advice is that, um, that you should probably have a mentor, you know, take a look at this first, because um, I think your contract's fairly basic. If you, if you understand some of these basics, uh, it's better that you negotiate politely rather than have an attorney do a lot of wordsmithing that really doesn't uh, uh, amount to much. Uh, my wife is an attorney, so I say this with some confidence here. However, I don't think you can go wrong to have an attorney take a look at it, but take charge yourself at the end 
understand the nuances yourself and make the best decision. My suggestion is have your contract run by someone you trust uh, or a mentor. Um, and with that, I will end. I think I'm at 10 minutes and we'll save, we'll save some time for questions. Thank you. Hey, so if it's okay, I'll start off with a question. It's Betsy Dexter yeah. again. Sure. So um, do you think that there's a maximum number of times that you should go back and forth negotiating a contract with a new employer? And do you think that could be something that if you're too uh, particular about could actually impact their, their desire for you to uh, participate? Yeah. I think um, I think that's a great question, Betsy. And I think um, uh, my strong suggestion is have uh, all your questions all aligned. It should really only be one or two back and forths. So you should be well prepared. They're obviously going to be well prepared. Your employer is going to know what they're going to give in and what they're not. Pretty much, they they've probably already decided this. So um, not a lot of back and forth. All communication should be super, super polite and respectful. Um, understand that they have dealt with hundreds of people and this is really your first impression if you take the job. So you really have to um, handle this with the highest level um, of emotional intelligence. Um, and again, my suggestion is run your emails, even your response emails by a mentor or someone who's done this before um, so that the tone and the language and the requests are coming off as being courteous and polite and professional. Great, thank you. If there are any other questions by the participants, feel free to turn on your microphone and, and ask in your camera. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Bora, Dr. Dexter, um, Raghav Chandra. I'm one of the general surgery residents from UT Southwestern. Thank you so much for having this session. Um, I just had a quick question in terms of contract negotiation. If we have specific interests like student education, health services research that we are seeking like, you know, dedicated academic time for, where in the negotiation or contract discussion process should we initiate those discussions? Uh, I think that's an excellent question. If you've got some uh, special interests, um, I think it's key to see if those align with the interests of your employer. Um, so I think you can bring that up during your, um, uh, your initial discussions. If there is reception to those things, then I would certainly work that in, if not into the contract, but certainly into um, into some sort of agreement um, where uh, there is an understanding that that some of the interests that you have in mind will be supported in some way, either financially or time-wise. So uh, gauge interest again. Um, uh, this is a two-way stream, right? You're sitting up. It's um, it's the art of the deal, for lack of a better word. I'm sorry to bring that analogy, but uh, but gauge interest from the other party. If there is interest, bring up what you want and um, and then absolutely work that in. Thank you so much. Um, my name is my name is Shopatal, one of the current CT fellows. Um, at UK, I do have a question, um, and I've heard mixed reviews about this as to what is the appropriate time where you should be thinking to sign the contract and have the contract in your hand before graduating um, per se. Can you provide a timeline as to what I should be looking forward to next year when I start this process? Um, uh, I would say she... Uh, as was mentioned before, I think um, I think the sooner the better, right? Um, so once you've um, once you've started interviewing and um, uh, and things move along and you're presented with a contract, I'll mention. Uh, I think this is important. Thank you for bringing this up. 
uh, a contract is typically a two part stage. So what you initially what you initially going to get is an offer letter. It's a one page sort of document where your salary, your duration, and some basics are going to be outlined. If that's acceptable, you sign that within you know short period of time, usually a week. Then you get the formal sort of contract. So my, my suggestion is as soon as you can. I mean. Uh, uh, I would have uh, I would have your next job in the bag as soon as uh, it's offered to you and you know it's the right position. Uh, the sooner the better. So um, uh, thank you very much. Um, we need to move on, and um, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Aaron Gillespie, um, who's an assistant professor of thoracic surgery at uh, Vanderbilt, I believe, and she's going to be talking about your first job, your first few years in your first job, how to make that a success and how to survive. Erin? Uh, Good morning, everybody. Can you guys see my screen okay? We can. Wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so pleased to be joining you guys today. I hope everybody's weekend is off to a great start. Um, I'm thrilled to be talking to you guys about the first few years in practice. Um, these are my disclosures. So I know that there's a lot of days you feel like you're just trying to survive when you're in a uh, residency, but there's actually a lot of things that you can do right now that can really just help you set up to hit the ground running when you start as a new faculty. I think it goes without saying that you should do as many cases as you can. There's no doubt that surgical independence towards the end of your training really helps to ease the transition into being an attending. Um, you know, the other thing that I always recommend is watching cases. Some of the most educational experiences that I had in addition to doing the cases was watching the cases, taking notes, drawing pictures, taking photos to make sure that I completely understood the setup, exposure, key structures and maneuvers. Having my own personal atlas as I transitioned into practice was really, really valuable, especially for those rare cases. Make sure that you're asking questions and above all else, and I cannot emphasize this enough, go to clinic. Clinic is where you learn some of the most critical parts of taking care of thoracic and cardiovascular surgical patients. The workup um, and deciding who should have a surgery and who shouldn't have a surgery. Learning in medicine is a lifelong pursuit and ingraining those habits early really pays off in dividends. And the reality is, is that the ends of our careers are unlikely to look, at the be look like the beginnings at all. Technology is gonna continue to change and knowledge and treatments are gonna continue to evolve at an unprecedented pace. And keeping up with this can be a challenging. There's a lot of different ways that you'll continue learning throughout your career. First and foremost, again, kind of going back to the habits that you're forming right now, Get into the habit of reading every single day so that you can just naturally continue this into your career. So when you're preparing for things like boards, staying up to date on the latest scientific changes in your practice, it's already ingrained. Don't hesitate to invest in yourself and invest in your career and future. So one of my personal passions that evolved over time was actually clinical trials. And I didn't have a background in that. I didn't have experience in that. Um, and so I actually went back to school as an attending to get an extra degree. Now, I have to caveat this with the fact that um, it takes time. Some days are humbling and you have to have very understanding partners because certainly can have an impact on the call schedule. But the experience has been invaluable. So make sure that you continue to build skills, continue to invest in yourself to help build the type of career that you would like to have. Conferences just like this one are another really great way to learn and also to collaborate. And remember that just going to surgery meetings may not actually support the type of career that you want to have. Uh, so for me, one of my passions is oncology. And so I actually tend dedicated oncology conferences as well. For some of my other colleagues who are passionate about endovascular techniques, they go to uh, cardiology, they go to vascular conferences. So important to remember to stay broad, especially earlier in your career. One of the very last things my mentor uh, told me before leaving fellowship was this. Bad news, kid. You never get to rotate off the Gillespie service. I laughed at the time. But all kidding aside, how many times have you thought in training, thank goodness this rotation is going to be finishing soon. And it can be for a variety of different reasons, right? A difficult patient, a difficult family member, a complication, a floor that you don't like rounding on. And while it's kind of a simple comment and 
was really funny and meant with the absolute best intent, I actually think this contains some really valuable piece of advice. And that's important to develop a career and a practice that you love to be a part of. You wanna be on your own service. So what are some of the things that you need to do? Well, first and foremost, you have to establish your clinical and operative expertise. Spend time in your first couple of years developing your method, honing your method for doing things. You're going to learn a lot of ways to do things in your training. You know, I had six mentors. I learned six different ways of doing things. And while all of these have helped me, you need to have a routine approach to your most common cases. Stay broad initially in your cases. And as you start to tackle more complex cases, don't hesitate to run it by your partners and your mentors. Schedule complex cases earlier in the day so you have more help around in case you need it. And be sure to schedule a mix of easier and more difficult cases in the same day. Get to know your OR staff and use them as a resource. The senior nurses in the operating rooms are often the ones who are gonna to help to orient you to the operating room, what pans are available, instruments. Communication is really critical in helping to build strong relationships um, and set yourself up for success. Because remember, there's more to a case than just the technical details. There's patient factors, there's the operating room staff, anesthetic considerations, and of course, teaching. And all of this is while you're trying to help get the best possible outcome for your patients. Inspire your team to be as vested in your patient outcomes as you are. I love to give my team feedbacks on the outcomes of patients, sharing great news, negative margins on a difficult case, or a patient getting to go home soon. Even months down the line, the ability of one of our cancer survivors to walk his daughter down the aisle at a wedding. Our success is their success, and making them part of that celebration only helps to enhance patient care. I cannot emphasize enough how important this team is to your success. Last but not least, build your confidence and clinical reputation. You have to demand excellence of yourself because no one else is going to hold you accountable the way that you will. And it's okay to be just a little bit selfish in your early years to protect your outcomes because these really do matter. And there's a lot of different areas that you're going to be evaluated as you transition into practice. Uh, the first, of course, is your ability to communicate with your team members, as well as referring providers. Your ability to recommend guideline concordant care for your patients, how your patients feel about their care, and of course, your surgical outcomes. I think one of the most challenging aspects of being a surgeon, in particular in your early career, is managing complications. And the reality is that complications will occur, and they will occur at an expected frequency, and how you handle that is, is really critical. So the first thing to remember is you don't want to back away. You need to push in. Ask for help. It's important to remember to be open, transparent with your patients, but also to run, especially in your early career, any complications by your partners. They can help to guide you um, in talking to your patients. As you sit down and talk to your patients, make sure that you share information very clearly. Carve out extra time to spend with them. Make a plan of action. Lay out your next steps, anticipated time to recover. Actually, some of the most grateful patients I've ever had were those that have helped to navigate a complication. Unfortunately, no amount of communication is going to comp uh, compensate for bad decisions. And so make sure that you are excellent at your craft. Select your patients carefully and provide excellent care. And then I think the last piece is, you know, learn from your mistakes and learn to move forward. It can be really challenging. And of course, there's all of these different thoughts that are going to be going through your heads. Is this going to affect my reputation? How is this going to affect my confidence? And the blame and shame game. Coping strategies, learning those early is really important because you can't stop doing cases, but each of these lessons is important to learn and to apply to the next case. The ability to find adequate mentorship is super important to your success. Build mentor relationships now and keep them. I still have mentors from my training days who are absolutely critical in my ongoing success in building my career. Your new partners will also be able to provide mentorship during your transition because they're super familiar with the system you're gonna be moving to. And so building these relationships also really important. Again, don't be afraid to look outside your specialty. Some of the greatest mentors that I personally have had have been medical oncologists. 
Um, and so, you know, making sure to build the things that you need to help you achieve success. Um, don't stay narrow minded, think broadly. And then of course, don't forget to build relationships with contemporaries. My early career colleagues and I have created these great early career physician groups. We learn together, we collaborate on research and we operate together. And this can be an incredible source um, of support and collaboration going forward understand the business of medicine. And I can't emphasize this enough. This is a piece that's really critical to kind of being a good citizen as you transition into practice. Understand how your group is gonna get compensated. What are the metrics that you need to achieve to be able to reach those goals? Is the number of cases, is the number of clinic visits, is a certain level of complexity? Make sure you understand what those metrics are. Understand billing and coding. Take time when you first start to set up meetings with the coders to make sure you understand how to bill your clinic visits, how to select CPT codes for the operating room, and make sure you're using the correct verbiage so that you're truly capturing what it is that you're doing in the operating room. And then I can't emphasize this enough, timely documentation. Part of being a good citizen is getting your work done in a timely fashion. Um, one of the things I think we all love is being surgeon educators, it's one of the really joyful parts of our, you know, our practice and our career. I love getting to see our general surgery residents, our early fellows transitioning from, you know, first learning how to do a very small part of a case to by the end of their time, uh, doing the cases from skin to skin. Uh, it's really extraordinary to watch that. And there's really incredible opportunities to educate in everything that you do. So make sure that you're taking opportunities and in the clinic on rounds, in the operating room, set out specific goals with your trainees. This is the part of the surgery that you're gonna to do today. And here's how I want you to accomplish that. Here are the metrics that we're looking for. And then don't forget that it's not just our trainees, it's medical students, it's undergraduate students as well who are interested in a career in medicine. And then of course, don't forget that simulation is a fantastic learning environment. And so if those opportunities are available at your institution, certainly leverage those, get involved early. Uh, the good news is, is that um, Dr. Allen gave me wonderful advice and I love the Gillespie service. And these are just a few of my reasons why. And it's important to remember every single day your why. So I guess my final thoughts as I close this section of our, our day today is make sure along the way, every single step now and in your early career that you're investing in yourself, you're investing in your team, you're investing in your colleagues, and of course, and perhaps most importantly, you're investing in your patients. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Erin. Um, are there any questions? You probably have time for one or two quick uh, questions. Erin, uh, I'll start off very quickly. Um, uh, could you share um, um, an issue or a difficulty that you had uh, when you first started and uh, how were you able to navigate through that? I'm sure we all have issues when we start. Um, what, what was one of yours and how was that uh, cured or corrected? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, one of the biggest ones was one of the big reasons I was hired was to help start and develop a robotics program. You know, and in thoracic surgery had done that before. We didn't have block time. We didn't have a team. Um, and so actually one of the first things I did right off the bat is I met with the urologists they were the big users of the robot. So I sat down in the chair's room and I said, this is my goal. I'm a brand new faculty. I need support. How did you go about building a program? How have other groups gone about building a program? How can we achieve success? And kind of leveraging a colleague in a completely different specialty to have him on my team and have him help support me was absolutely critical. He brought me onto the robot um, uh, committee so that I could start to be a part of the conversations for developing teams, for assigning block time. Um, and, and so really, you know, making sure that you're reaching out and using the resources that are available at your institution that might not be just in your group is really critical. And actually he was one of the first people in the room on the day of my first surgery to congratulate me on starting the program um, before we even started the case. And so, um, you know, something that you think is going to be a huge challenge potentially um, ends up forging incredible relationships and support. Oh, I think that's incredible. I think, uh, I think learning uh, in a multidisciplinary fashion really builds your base there. And um, I think um, 
really will hold you well. Excellent talk, uh, Aaron. Um, and I think we'll move on to the next uh, talk, Betsy. Okay, thanks. Uh, that was an excellent talk, Dr. Gillespie, and you're getting some great comments on the chat. Um, I'm honored to present uh, Dr. Sinu Reddy. He's the Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery at TriStar Centennial Med Center in Nashville, Tennessee. And he's gonna be talking to us all about working smart and investing wisely for the future. Dr. Reddy, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you're able to see my screen and hear me clearly. So I was given the task to spend a little time with you this morning to really talk uh, and segue to the wonderful talk you just heard about investing in yourself. And also you have to invest in your future. And I think it's very important for you to understand all of you out there, you may be in different aspects or time points in your journey, but the stages of investing uh, really occurs over time. And one of the stages is put and take account. Then you start beginning your investing. Then you become systematically the way you do your investing. Then you probably will segue into strategic investing and maybe or maybe not into speculative investing. But before you do any of that, I think the first thing you have to do is take inventory. And the inventory you have to take is who are you? What type of investor are you? Is investing something you're interested in at all? Is it something that you feel like it's a chore and that you have to do? Is it something that you enjoy? Do some of you find it scary or daunting? Uh, do Some of you may find it very easy and second nature. Or is it something that you want someone else to do on your behalf? But one, those questions are important questions to start with and to define who you are in that matrix. But first and foremost, before you can do anything, you have to have savings in order to invest. And the understanding is that this is your safety net. This is the account that you set up to pay for any short-term needs or unexpected events that may occur. And there's the standard kind of teaching is six months of net pay. And you will find that this is very, very important. Think of what happened during the pandemic to millions of Americans. Those who had six months of net pay set aside were able to weather the storm. Those that did not felt a lot of stress. So always think about this as you go through your life's journey. As you then begin to start, uh, your investment journey, understand what investing is. It's really savings to earn some kind of financial return. And it really begins when you start deciding that your savings are permanent rather than temporary. But as you may have heard uh, Faiz talk about earlier, the initial investment should really be in that part that uh, will be included in your contract, which is some employer-sponsored plan. You should always max out whatever tax-advantaged employer-sponsored plan is available. This really became important to me when I started my journey. I started out in academic medicine in Texas. And Dr. Calhoun then was my chairman. And he said to me, he said, Sinu, I can't pay you a lot but he said, you're lucky to work for the state of Texas. And if you take advantage of what Texas has to offer in terms of its retirement plan, you'll find that it'll serve you well. Well, I did that. I maxed out, even though I was earning a very modest salary back then, I maxed out what I could. And during my time working with him, when I left, I had about $220,000 in savings just inside that Texas 403B. Today, that's worth over $1.4 million. So it shows you that if you're patient and you take advantage of those plans, it can grow to large sums of money without even having to do anything. It's important also to pay off loans. Debt can be something that you can use as a tool throughout your uh, financial life, but in general, debt will uh, be more of a burden than of a tool. Also, you may need to build up down payments for larger purchases, so it's important to start saving early. Once you've kind of accomplished those early goals, then you can turn into systematic investing. When you kind of become comfortable with uh, having a re regular amount of savings put aside, you've maxed out your plan, uh, whether it's a 403B or 401K, then you can start setting aside additional monies for other investing activities, whether those are now 529 plans for children's education. If your goal is to retire early, you may want to look at other after-tax plans or deferred compensation uh, plans, or think about making major acquisitions. Something to understand that many people confuse what is an investment versus something that they're purchasing. Insurance is something you buy, not as an investment, but something you need to protect yourself, whether it's, invest, it's insurance to protect your car, your home, or your income, that's what insurance is. Rarely should you confuse insurance with a modality of savings. Second home, similarly, may be a lot of fun, maybe something you enjoy, maybe something you pine for, 
but don't confuse a second home and its investment versus investment real estate, which is something that pays you every month, such as a commercial property or multifamily housing. As you progress through your stages of investing, then you may encounter what you hear so much about the buzz today is speculative investing. But be very, very cautious in this arena. Many investors may choose never to speculate. You may hear among your friends, your peers, all about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, NFTs, any myriad of investment opportunities out there. But be very cautious with these and understand what truly investing is. And that's what the core component is to increase your wealth, to have money aside for emergencies. And over the long run, investments are gonna earn you higher profits than just general savings. The average that a typical stock market um, fund, whether you do an ETF or just investing in the S&P 500, it's gonna give you eight to 10% over many year period of time. And think of investing in 10 year blocks of time. That's going to uh, compare very favorably to the 1% to 2% max that you'll ever earn in just a savings account. Investing can be fun, but it can also be challenging. One question many people ask is, well, how much should I save? And my answer to them is, you should save until it's a little bit painful. Um, I think that's when you've reached the right amount of savings. If it's easy, you're probably not saving enough. The other thing is, remember the number one thing to do when people propose you investments. You, as a physician, as someone who's gonna be in the highest earning brackets of incomes in the United States or abroad, you're gonna be a target for many people coming to you with investment ideas and proposals. But you should have a series of questions that you ask them every time. You know, what is the return? But more importantly, what is the risk? Is the return stable over time or is it gonna vary? How much money is gonna be available to me once I give it, uh, put it into the investment? Is it locked in for five years, seven years? Remember, many of these type of investments are going to be illiquid. Also, how inflation-proof is the investment? Is it going to earn a, a certain rate of investment uh, return while inflation starts going much higher? Are there tax advantages? For example, economic enterprise zones. And are those tax advantages captured now or at some point in the future? So these are all very, very important questions to ask. But the most important question to ask when you're taking, particularly as you go out on the risk and the speculative curve of investing, is can I afford to lose all of this money? Could I afford to lose some of this money or can I not afford to lose any of this money? And that's what's gonna give you the most informed decision. Some wise investment practices, you really have to define your financial goals, whether it's wealth building or philanthropy or retiring early. Remember to go slowly. This is a marathon, it's not a sprint. You should also follow through on your goals, plans and ideas. It's very important to goal set. You all are excellent at doing that already to achieve where you are today, but you should do this in your investment life as well. I can't uh, stress the importance of keeping good records. You got to measure what you do. People will tell you you made all sorts of returns, but you have to measure your returns for yourself. Always seek good investment advice and be broad in your seeking the source. Uh, a really smart heart surgeon told me at Emory one time when I was finishing, he goes, always have two investment advisors. If you are proposed with some idea, ask one of them what you think about it. If that person says it's a good idea, go ask the other person. If the other person says it's a good idea, it probably is. However, if one person says it's a bad idea and the other person says it's a bad idea, it probably is. And then if they're kind of split, then you need to go find a third source. But that's the importance of seeking broad advice. Also keep current on your investment knowledge. Things change, limited partnerships, crypto, whatever it may be, all of these change over time and the tax implications change over time. So it's important to keep yourself abreast. As you know, there's always changes in the tax code, changes in how 529 plans are treated, how 401ks are treated and so forth. Most importantly, know your limits. Just like in the operating room, it's important to know that in the investment arena, be very cautious with what you know and how much you know and which arena you're going to play in. Be read and study widely and wisely. There are many sources of information and there's a whole cottage industry out there now of physicians who are making their money off websites, which I put there at the bottom. You may know of many of these websites, whether it's White Coat Investor or many of these uh, real estate doctor or MD real estate. All of these folks, remember, are generating revenue through their websites. So again, it's just caveat emptor. Be wary of what you're reading and what information you're getting. Also make sure, as I told you, have good financial advisors, but be cautious of their fees. 
make sure that they're transparent with how much they're charging you. And there's nothing like going to the source. You know, it can be kind of painful, but occasionally, you know, when you read through the actual documentation of the investment that's being proposed, you'll find many interesting little nuances in those details that may dissuade you from investing in them. But the most important thing of all is start early and be very strategic and be consistent. Thank you so much. I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing some questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy. That was an excellent talk. Um, I just had a beginning question for you. Um, sometimes when you're looking to join a practice, they actually want you to invest a little bit of money into the practice itself, particularly if it's a private practice and they own their own equipment or their own surgery center. What do you think about this as a new graduate coming out? Do you think that's something that you could think about investing in and how do you get advice about that? You know, that's an excellent question. And that is more and more common these days because surgery centers can be highly profitable sources of ancillary revenue. And I think you have to really first take uh, um, a little bit of stock in the group, the stability of the group. I would research what the history has been of that surgical center and give yourself a year or so to stabilize your practice and then go into thinking about actually putting cash into one of those type of investments. But oftentimes those are uh, a really good source of additional income for the uh, young surgeon or young practitioner. Great, thanks. If any of the participants have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, video. You know, one of the things that uh, I didn't go into great detail about was insurance. And I think, you know, people should understand uh, what the purpose of insurance is and how to purchase it and how to utilize it. In general, life insurance should be some sort of term policy that covers the term that you need it for. For example, I bought 20 and 25 year terms and those are ending in a few years and that works out perfectly fine for my needs because I don't really need life insurance anymore. I've gotten, my children are getting educated. They're able to be independent and so forth. Similarly, disability insurance is something you should have, but once you get into age 60 and you may be financially independent, you may not really need disability insurance much uh, longer after that, unless it's being provided as a perk by your employer. And then finally, the most uh, important insurances to have are certainly car insurance, because you're very likely to have some event happen with your vehicle and home insurance or renter's insurance, because it's very common to have some uh, event happen like that. So, you know, often people talk about making sure disability insurance policies cover exactly what you do specifically as a surgeon. Do you think that that's important or do you think uh, I guess it depends on yourself and whether you'd be okay practicing as a different kind of physician if you couldn't operate anymore. What's your advice about that? Yeah, and another excellent question, and one that I've, it's kind of changed over time. Um, it was very, very important to have specialty specific type coverage uh, 20, 25 years ago. As times have changed, many of these policies, the devil is in the detail, and you do have to spend some time thinking about just what you pointed out. Would you be comfortable um, switching professions or switching within your profession? Or is it very important that the coverage be specific to what you do? I think in general, it's pretty important to be specific to what you do. It would be unusual for any of us in this era of medicine to be able to switch gears that easily or even want to in the setting of a, a mishap. The three friends that I have that are currently on disability policies uh, typically had injuries to their neck or their back, which precluded them from doing cardiac surgery. So they're able to collect their disability, but they have gone on one as a cardiac intensive care physician. Um, the way these policies work is they'll pay out a certain amount, but you can't earn more than a certain amount. So it doesn't preclude you from going and seeking other employment. Another one has shifted into industry and works for Edwards Life Sciences and is their chief safety, safety officer. Again, he's able to earn some income doing that, but also his policy, because it was specially specific, continues to pay out to him. Excellent. Perfect. I think that's an important point that you bring up that you want to make sure that there's a closet you can still earn some safe, you know, money financially and still, you know, work and, and draw your, your disability money. Dr. Reddy, I think this is a really important topic for all of us to understand, and um, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Do you have any thoughts about um, liability insurance? 
Yeah, I think that the, those are typically called umbrella policies. And seeing that I have a 16 and 18 year old and, and they drive, it's very important to have those. So all of your policies will have some degree of liability coverage. And what's important to take stock of is then do you need additional on top of that? And most of us do for that kind of core key period of your life. Certainly, if you also have second homes or if you have uh, if you're hosting parties or events at your house, it's important to go ahead and broaden that coverage out to several million dollars. Fortunately, those coverages are very affordable, uh, but it's some, sometimes it's an afterthought. So something all of you should think about. Yeah, I would just add in one other thing too. A lot of us as physicians um, need help at home in terms of childcare in the house or something like that. So it's also important to understand the regulations um, revolving around those people and whether or not they would be considered household employees. Some states require that you offer workman's compensation insurance um, to somebody you know, working in your home. So it's really important to understand those rules. So one other thing with the insurance and something that I did is remember if you're the key breadwinner for your family, uh, it's important to cover your spouse with a very uh, strong insurance policy as well. Because if you have a loss of, of that's your team, uh, that's helping take care of the children. If you lose your spouse, uh, then you have to be able to have be able to afford some sort of that. This is the type of help you're talking about. So that's the reason to have fairly robust policies on your spouse for at least for those key periods of time. And that's why term insurance is particularly useful for those periods of time. I agree. They come in ten. And on that years. on that same vein, in that same vein, you know, at one point in time, we sort of were thinking about liability as far as the litigious society in, in medicine and allocating assets to mainly someone else. What is your advice about that? So that if you happen to be sued for medical problems as a private person, uh, what do you think about that? I think it's important to understand your state's tort laws. For example, in some states, there is the ability to go deep into physicians' finances and have access to a lot more of their uh, wealth. In other states, the tort laws are written such that there are tort limits and that they're limited uh, in terms of the settlements that can be obtained. And uh, you need to understand how your particular practice or your institution protects you also what the breadth of that coverage is. So yeah, I have some physician friends who are very paranoid about that and they title everything in layers and layers of LLCs and have nothing in their name. I have other physicians that uh, really have not uh, found the need to do that. I personally have not done a lot of that retitling and moving everything around. Asinu, that was an excellent talk. Um, we um, want to stay on schedule, so we'll move yep. on to the Perfect. next. Uh, uh, thank you again. You gave us a little bit of a heart attack by not joining initially, but I'm glad you were <laughs> able to. Um, okay, so uh, it's, my, uh, it's my pleasure to to introduce Brittany Schweisenberger. Um, she uh, is Assistant Professor of Thoracic Surgery, I believe at Duke, and um, we'll be talking uh, about um, the important topic of personal wellness um, and how we as physicians and surgeons take care of ourselves as we take care of our patients. Um, I'm so, hey, thank you so much for that generous introduction. Um, I'm having a little trouble sharing my screen. We might just have to have uh, Beth uh, do my slides until. Let me try again. Let's see. Uh, if you scroll your uh, mouse, the bottom of your laptop, you might see a tab that shows up with share screen in green. Um, and then if your talk is already open, you'll see the window and you can share. Yeah, I'm, let's see. Okay, I'm sorry, one second. Okay, I'm just gonna have to, I'm so sorry. You might wanna go to Ryan and then I can be the third one. Brittany, I'm ready to share. I can share your slides. Okay. Or, okay, I, I could get it fixed if you skip to Ryan and then come back to me. Do you want to just do that? Ryan, are you ready? I am ready. Thanks, girlfriend. <laughs> then uh, I will would like to introduce uh, Ryan Hassan. 
she's an assistant professor of thoracic surgery at the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. And Ryan is going to talk to us about the timely subject of social media, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Thanks, Dr. Hassan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me just, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Put this in presentation. Okay. Um, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present today. As um, everybody stated, I will be talking about social media, and hopefully you find this helpful as you're navigating into your first attending jobs um, about what to do and what not to do when it comes to social media. I do not have any disclosures. So talking points, I will be in doing an introduction to social media, talking about uh, different types, what the purposes are, etc. I will be briefly going into the potential benefits. I will talk about the pitfalls in usage and things to avoid. And then my final points will just do it via summary and we'll hopefully have some time for acknowledgements and questions. So how to use social media. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is understand its purpose and figure out your purpose for its use. So there's many different goals for social media. Some of it may be education. Some of it may be entertainment or social, sharing with friends, uh, staying in touch with high school friends, college friends, elementary school friends, et cetera. You can get a lot of how-to info on that. Um, but for career purposes, a lot of that has to do with uh, getting your brand out there and establishing it as an entity within the medical field. So you want to determine your goals for your own accounts. Um, keeping in mind, there's many different types of accounts. There's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, et cetera. Um, you ideally want to have some idea of what you use each account for which purpose. For example, I use my Twitter mostly for work. Um, I will very rarely tweet about um, personal issues or things that are going on, but it's uh, mostly about what's going on with work, what my research is doing, and how to advance that. Whereas my Instagram, that's purely to stay connected to my family and friends, and that's all about my personal life. Um, if you are using for work purposes, you want to make sure that you invest the time, um, and I'll get into that a little bit in our next slide about getting started, um, but it's going to take some time to keep yourself relevant, uh, keep, stay up to date with the info that's coming out, comment on that info, share some of the info that's going on within your research projects or your lab or um, your clinical practice, etc. cetera, um, and you need to be aware of that. Um, if using for entertainment, you wanna have fun, but you always wanna keep it professional. Um, unfortunately, even if your account is private, even if it's locked, um, anybody can screenshot anything and people are always watching. And so you have to be mindful of that, especially within the field that we work in. Um, again, last point is you wanna take note of those who have done it well, and then you wanna take note of those that have floundered. So in terms of getting started, as I said before, you wanna decide on which tools will serve which purpose. Um, and think about their desired content. So for example, for my Twitter, it's really to promote the research that I'm doing, the DEI efforts that I'm involved in, social justice topics, et cetera. Um, and as I said, when in, in investing the time you, for your avatar, you wanna have a professional looking photo. It is very easy these days to take your iPhone or your Android, whichever camp that you're in, take the portrait mode picture um, and have that out there. But that is gonna be your best face forward. And it's what people are going to look to when they're looking at the information. Um, so try to avoid things like putting pictures of your cat or dog or just greenery because it kind of um, does not yield to the uh, um, credibility of your account. People may think you're a bot, et cetera. Um, you wanna include your title. You wanna include your places of education and your affiliations. Uh, so for example, mine has assistant professor of surgery at Dartmouth. Um, and then you wanna consider including fun facts. So for example, my twin sister is at University of Michigan and just does childhood obesity research. And so I have that in my feed. We do some stuff together. Um, and that as many people have met me through her research and many people have met her through my research or my tweets and we constantly promote each other. So um, that can be a way to make new colleagues, new friends, get new um, collaborations established, et cetera. And then you also wanna provide links to your other social media that are associated with it for work purposes. So for example, this could be your LinkedIn account. I have a link to my faculty webpage at Dartmouth Hitchcock or other sites of interest. If you have a lab link um, for your lab, you can do that as well well. Um, 
So in terms of building your presence, uh, there's a couple of different ways that you can use social media. The first is as a learning and educational tool for yourself. Um, you can catch breaking news. Um, you can learn about disease processes, interesting cases, read new publications, view conference talks, etc. cetera. Um, you can go down so many rabbit holes on Twitter, so you need to be careful that you're establishing time limits for yourself and that type of thing. But if you're for example, the um, recent xenotransplant that took place. I found out about that first on Twitter and then was able to read many articles about it. And then actually when it was actually published, saw those articles on Twitter. So you can learn a lot. Um, you just wanna set boundaries on how much time you are devoting to that. I think most importantly, building your brand and educating others. So for example, if you do research or if you do any DEI efforts, if you are involved in education or teaching residents or medical students, once you get to your job, that's a great time to promote that. Um, you can introduce that, what your interests are, et cetera. You can also amplify your recent publications. Um, nowadays, whenever you get a paper published, the publisher will actually send you a link so that you can tweet out your report or um, uh, share it widely with the masses. And so I highly encourage you to do that. You can share conference presentations, invited talks, announcements, career moves, promotions, et cetera. And you can also meet new people and form collaborations. So it's a great way to showcase what you are doing. I think that in this day and age, with everything so electronic and everybody dependent on electronic devices, you have to venture out into this and get your name and brand out there and celebrate your achievements and let people know what you're doing. It's I've found it's one of the best ways to form collaborations. So in terms of things what not to do, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about staying efficient and avoiding the bad and the ugly. Um, so when it comes to efficiency, I've kind of hinted at this, but I think first you want to make sure that you set limits. Um, and whether this is for work or this is for play, um, you want to make sure that, um, you know, say, for example, OK, I'm going on Twitter today and either I have something to uh, post or I'm going to look for other things that I'm interested in on esophageal cancer. What are people talking about today or lung cancer? Or I saw that there's this new um, clinical trial that just you know, talks about adjuvant therapy. Give yourself a time limit, you know, and try to stick to that. Um, it's very easy to get distracted, go down the wormholes. You look up 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour later, and you're still on there scrolling. Um, so definitely set limits for yourself. Find a time that will work for you. Um, you know, and it depends on what your task is. If you're just trying to relax, um, maybe before you go to bed, looking at social things, but you want to avoid the doom scrolling, which I'll talk about in the next slide, um, because that can definitely um, either prevent you from getting good rest, which is what's going to be needed, or um, get you into situations where um, it may lead to conversations on Twitter that are not uh, necessarily beneficial. Um, as I've said before, set a goal or limit before you use and then walk away at certain points. Um, remember why you're there, whether it was to post something, whether it was to research something, whether it was just to take a break. Um, don't let it overtake your life because it easily can. I can um, highly recommend most phones will give you a little printout of how much social media you are using during the week. I pay attention to that and make sure it's not too high or, um, you know, if it's not enough, then hey, I, I did better than I did last week. Um, specific pitfalls to avoid when using social media, safety first. Um, especially for things like Twitter, in order for you to gain some traction on that, you will most likely need to have your page uh, be public, but that doesn't mean that you have to share everything and you know, you want to think about being safe. So for example, I have a five month old son at home. I don't tweet out pictures of him. I may share that on Instagram or Facebook, but I'm not going to share that on Twitter just because it's open to hundreds of millions of people. Um, so thinking about that, thinking before you tweet, um, again, be thoughtful um, before you're posting and tweeting, it, especially if it's for your work account, think twice before you post it. Um, it's one thing if you're posting your research findings or that type of thing, but if you're posting something that's commenting either on political issues, social issues, um, definitely think three or four times um, before you post that. Um, remember, it's a slippery slope. I think that what's happened over the last couple of years and given all of the social and political events that have happened, you may feel that you can't stay silent on certain things, which is fine. But I think really being thoughtful about what you publish, what's being respectful, um, you know, you have to take that into mind. And if you have to, um, 
think three and four times about it or really question yourself, should I tweet this or should I post this? Maybe you shouldn't, okay? Because not everything needs to be posted. Um, I will say, don't engage the trolls. They're out there and they're sitting behind their um, computers with their liquid kryptonite, um, ready to try to ruin your day. I remember when I posted that I passed my CT boards, I was so excited and, um, and it took traction and got 5,000 likes, you know, not that I was even looking for that, but, you know, there were definitely a couple of people that were like, oh, big deal, you know, like, you don't need to post that. And it's just like, really, you know, this is, you know, a monumental achievement in my life or somebody else's life, and they're just trying to ruin it. So, you know, just don't engage. There's a block button for a reason. Um, you will often find that those uh, conversations are not productive and a waste of your time. I would say this, never, ever, ever post patient info um, with any descriptive details. And I would actually caution you about patient, pa uh, posting patient info in general, even if you're not saying time, um, you know, what, when it happened or where it happened or that type of thing. If it's an interesting case or if it's a rare case, um, your patients, they look at social media. I've had many patients that say, oh, I saw you on Twitter and I saw that study. Um, but they may also see that like, wow, my doctor told me that that was like the most rarest case they'd ever seen. And then I just saw a picture of my insides on Twitter, you know, like you don't ever want to be that person. Um, yes, you can get patient permission for certain things, but I think in some respects, if it's that you know, newsworthy, go ahead and publish it as a case report. Um, but um, just be careful with that, because I think it's a very slippery slope. In a court of law, you have little defense. Um, you can say that you're educating folks, but I think in this day and age, people want their privacy. And we as providers and physicians need to be um, uh, mindful of that patient privacy. You want to remember everybody's watching. The internet never forgets and always proofread your posts, especially with Twitter, because there is no edit button. Um, in terms of avoiding burnout, definitely avoid the doom scrolling that I said before. Take scheduled social media breaks. You know, I am post five months postpartum. And during the first two months, I said, I am not going to be on social media, except maybe to post pictures of my child. And that's only in my private accounts, you know, but I took a break and that's okay to do that. If you're going through something, take a break. If you want to spend time with your family and disengage, take a break, but schedule those breaks in. Realize that you can easily become a slave to your social media accounts and don't let that happen. Think proactively. Um, again, as I said, set limits on your scrolling and remember, why am I here? If it's to relax, then let me do something relaxing, like look at a cooking, um, you know, how to if I'm doing this for entertainment purposes. If I'm doing this for work purposes, let me get this paper out here. Let me talk about our upcoming projects and let me focus on that task and then get off. Um, so that's uh, pretty much what I had to say today. You know, again, social media can have many potential benefits. You can learn new things. You can educate yourself and others, build your brand, make new friends. But you have to think before you tweet or before you post anything online, set boundaries, not only to increase your efficiency, but to also to decrease burnout. And most important, have fun. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm open to questions if there's any more time. Ryan, thank you so much. We're running a little bit late, so we'll move right into the uh, last talk. Uh, Brittany, are you ready? Yes, sir. Let's do it. Okay, I just, um, let's see, the other one, stop sharing. Yep, stop share. Thanks. Oh my God, it worked, yes. Okay, hold on one second. All right, y'all see everything okay? Yeah, we do. Looks good. So um, my topic today is taking care of oneself and family and the importance of personal wellness. I'm very excited to give you this talk today because it's something that I think about every day and work on every day as an adult cardiac surgeon. Um, I was provided an outline, so I'm going to jump through some topics pretty quickly. And um, and really, it's crazy to me how much of this is still relevant during training and as I become an attendant. And I'm not even going to tell you that there's a light at the end of the tunnel because uh, what we're going to be talking about is how to own your life every day. So I'm going to relevant just for So um, I want to land somewhere between pedantic versus campy versus a TED talk because uh, that's this, this, this topic. Um, you know, start with uh, writing your own narrative and deciding who you are and that you can only control yourself. And that's, that's I think, the best uh, takeaway message for you today. 
Um, Brene Brown said, you can either walk inside your own story and own it, or you can stand outside of your story and hustle for your worth every day. And, and I believe every word of that saying. So, um, so everything I talk about is something I've lived through and learned. And um, here's some major concepts to remember as we walk through this. Uh, where the mind goes, the energy follows. Hugi, it's an operational term that my husband loves to talk about, process of ongoing improvement. So 1% better every day, 1% happier every day. A CT training is tough, but I'm tougher. I want it more than I fear it. I don't need to be somebody, I already am somebody. And progress, not perfection. So uh, one of the stresses of, of you know, going through CT fellowship is really losing yourself. And so how do you maintain yourself during training? How do you maintain personal growth and cultivate hobbies? So when you're applying to medical school, you have to be a Renaissance person and do everything. And then you become a shell of your former self uh, during training, but that's okay because training is a limited time period. And, and I'd rather, instead of thinking of yourself as a shell, uh, more that you're shipped down to basics. So how do you maintain your personal growth and cultivate hobbies? Keep it super simple. Pick one or two right now, okay? Something easy. For me, it was exercise and music. That's it. And I don't mean playing music. I don't even play a musical instrument. I just mean listening to music. Um, what was really wonderful for me as a fellow was to go back to the music that I listened to in college. So the yeah, yeahs and outcasts and fun stuff like that. Just, you know, when I'm driving to work in the morning. Um, and then exercise. I'm a Peloton zealot. I have the bike and the um, and the tread, and I make dedicated time for myself. Uh, but the incredible thing, I love this picture because even during my dedicated personal time um, that's supposed to be protected, my daughter comes and and joins me for it. So it's not going to be clean. It's not going to be perfect. Um, and then you, while you're working on yourself, you want to cultivate your emotional intelligence. So optimize your dead zone time when you're walking from the parking lot to, um, when you're walking from the parking lot to the hospital and going to see patients, you can listen to podcasts, uh, or eBooks. Personally, I really enjoy a uh, knowledge project by Shane Parrish. And uh, I really enjoyed this book by Mark Manson that I listened to on audiobook, of course. Um, and it helps you organize the way that you think about yourself and the world. Uh, so work-related stress and avoiding burnout, a super hot topic right now. Um, I think the, the most important way to think about it is self-care is not selfish. Um, and you have to work on that every single day. So uh, at risk of sounding trite, exercise, sleep, nutrition. So those are, those are important things and there's no way around it, as we all know. Um, personally, I became vegetarian. That was really helpful for me to be more thoughtful about protein and, and how I wanted to get through my day and sleep. Sleep is still a problem as a faculty member. So this picture was taken just a few months ago. Um, and you know, it's, it's really exhausting, um, to, to do what we do. So I uh, exercise deep in nutrition to help maintain perspective. Remember that where the mind goes, the energy follows and you want to improve your self-talk. So seeking mentorship, uh, you know, Erin already talked about this. She did a great job of talking about other specialties. I would have never guessed that I would have um, so many other specialty specialists as mentors. Um, and here I think about mentorship as a stock portfolio and, and now y'all are experts in investment with earlier talks. So, you know, find someone local. Dr. Peter Smith was my um, boss. He just stepped down, but he was an incredible mentor with a lot of surgeries under his belt to talk to. Other institutions, you know, Mario Gardino at Cornell. I wanted people like me, like Joe Chiqui and Jennifer Lawton, who for several years was the only female that I knew that was married with kids as a cardiac surgeon. And that was an incredible resource to have. Um, talk to people who are your age, contemporaries. Amy Fiedler and I talk all the time, you know, bad cases, good cases, um, and then, you know, institutional stuff. Uh, people who are who are like me, cardiologists, or not like me, cardiologists, John Alexander, um, and really not like me, I found radiologists who are uh, fantastic mentors who are trying to help me. And meet regular. You know, you can set the regular meetings up, or you can just know that you can call each other uh, once a month. How to achieve quality family time. This, uh, you know, this is relevant to everybody in the world, but uh, I think with our our lack of time, we are going to be more sensitive to it. Um, to go over some broad concepts, quantity, quality over quantity, and manage expectations, certainly with your spouse, um, when you're going to be there, when you're not going to be there. I think communication is something uh, that my husband and I talk about all the time. 
concept of communication. Um, and, you know, inform the kids what you do. Mrs. Smith is sick and she needs me. Um, I tell the patient, my kids about my patients, you know, that, they, that they're sick and that they've been through a lot and that's what I have to do right now. And that really helps for them instead of me just disappearing. Um, I show them pictures of my patients if my patients want to <laughs> take a picture with me. Um, and then except you won't be there for everything. Uh, you make dedicated time. You know, if you get, go call for a lung transplant, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time for everybody to get to the hospital and you're five minutes away, then you can spend 30 minutes doing sidewalk chalk with the kid and then, you, and, um, and then they will feel fulfilled. Um, so challenges of raising a family, uh, again, this is not just CT specific, but um, time is your most precious resource and it takes a village. Um, so seeking out family help, outsourcing as much as possible. Um, I think it's really important for kids to finger paint, but not in my house. So they do that at daycare. Um, we've chosen a corporate daycare uh, because we think of its early education, Bright Horizons, because they have a dedicated curriculum that is approved and all of their um, centers use the same curriculum. So that makes us feel that it's based in a foundation of, of, of building their uh, skills. And they have an app that's sophisticated enough to put daily pictures on and I can use in between cases, um, you know, what they eat. And, um, and then allocation of household duties is huge. Um, my husband and I are at a point where my two major responsibilities, well, my one major responsibility during fellowship was unloading the dishwasher because he did that. And I did it every month. Um, and now I unload the dishwasher and make bottles. But that was an active discussion. You know, what work can I do? What's practical for me to do? And where can I help? Um, more, of the, more of the logistics of it, of, of taking care of yourself and your family, is to stay accountable. So um, I listened to this book on audio, um, Measure What Matters. So they talk about objectives and key results or OKRs. And again, this is just the logistics of, of really staying accountable to yourself. So you create your OKRs for yourself and your OKRs for your family. And I've done it for um, my job. So some of them are um, big goals, like uh, Aaron said, creating a robot program and then the logistics of that. And then some are more reach goals. Um, so here's an example of, of, of an OKR for myself and for my spouse. So we want to improve our emotional connection. And so we do a date night every three weeks, basically. Um, but to be honest, we started off a date night, but this is what happened. So we went to a Duke uh, basketball game at Cameron Stadium, which is, you know, thousands of people. Um, the whole building shakes from the energy, and I felt it. So um, <laughs> that highlights the limitations that we face every day, you know, we're so tired. Um, so we switched our date night to actually a date day. So a lot of the times we'll go out from you know, nap time onward from one to five or so. Um, and then another just fun thing to show him that I'm thinking about him, text him a fun song that I've been listening to every week. Um, so work-life imbalance, it's, it's not work-life balance. Let's just reword it and accept it all right now. Um, and this is messy. So when I'm making, uh, when I'm, you know, we always use the analogy of plates in the air, trying to keep them all up, but I think this is highly overly simplified. It's, it's more like this. So layers upon layers of, of, of plates in, that we're trying to keep in the air um, from everything that you've heard today, you know, your own personal finances, um, trying to get your job going off launch and develop a program, um, taking care of your family. Um, so my kind of, Reestat, my reality check is when I'm trying to make a decision for my family over my career, I ask myself, what's the alternative? You know, when I'm on my deathbed, do I want to remember doing one more cabbage or being at my kids' baseball game? Um, and I put this picture up here because this is, uh, so I started fellowshipping, I did traditional fellowship trip, started in 2015, I finished 2018. And, um, and I just went out for a girls' night, ladies' night for the first time. In 2015, last weekend. So uh, we went axering, and and I, I think that that's something really important to keep in mind is that um, you have dedicated yourself to an incredible profession that's very um, rewarding, but it's going to take the majority of your time. So you know you're not going to get to do the you know the friend stuff that you used to do, and you have to be patient. And then at some point, you know your career will stabilize, your kids will sit through the night, and then you can go axering. Um, and I would love to. Uh, 
So um, again, work-life imbalance make hay while the sun shines, okay? Go for a walk um, before you have to go back to the hospital and write your own narrative. So when you ask, the, you get asked this question or people talk about what is your proudest accomplishment, um, answer this question differently than what's at the surface. You know, at the surface you have on your CV, you run a marathon, uh, you have the fastest distal anastomosis. I've decided that mine is building the strength of my backbone. So, and I redefine my own success. So I've, I heard this somewhere and I modified it for myself, but I, I think about it and I use it as a reference. So working on projects that I love, so research and making a difference in CT surgery, providing amazing clinical care in a healthy environment with people that I like. So I love my partners, they're fantastic, which allows me to take care of myself and my family. Thank you so much. Brittany, um, really, really enjoyed your talk. And um, I think it's inspirational to a lot of our um, uh, younger fellows and quite frankly, to all of us. Uh, any questions uh, for Dr. Schweisenberger? Uh, I'll just lead off um, uh, fairly quickly. Um, uh, I think you mentioned it that that our work is sort of, you know, imbalanced and we try and balance it as best as we can. I think that's sort of the premise. Um, uh, do you feel that your priorities change as you advance in your career? I'm sure they do, but uh, how, uh, how do you change your goals as you advance for uh, the first three or five years and beyond through your career? And do you have to, you know, sit down and reset what, what is important for you and to you and uh, for your family. Yes, absolutely. And, and like I referenced, I'm extremely intentional about it. Um, I set up my own OKRs uh, when I started on faculty four years ago. And, um, and then I had my third kid and then I went on maternity leave and I was so afraid to go on maternity leave because I thought, okay, my practice is gonna fail when I come back. Um, and then it was quite the opposite. When I came back, I, it actually gave me a break from my practice to rethink where I wanted to go and what my focus was going to be. And I redid some of my OKRs. And um, a good example is, you know, people talk about the triple threat of uh, surgeon, scientist, and educator, which is just not, it's not that simple. And, you know, where's family in that? So when I prioritized those four, um, I was actually associate program director and then I reprioritized, I finished um, uh, my master's in science and health science. So I said, when I prioritize it, education is fourth, um, it's below family. And, um, and the education component was interfering with my family. So I said, okay, clinician, researcher, family, educator is the fourth one. And so I stepped down. Um, and that was a hard conversation to have with uh, with my partners, with the residents, and with um, and with my boss. But um, it, it wasn't sustainable otherwise. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, if there are no more uh, pressing uh, questions, we're at time. Um, I wanted to thank uh, the team again. Uh, Beth, Betsy, Elizabeth, um, all our uh, faculty for uh, taking our time from their schedules and a Saturday afternoon again, um, uh, the imbalance of what we do. So my uh, personal thanks and gratitude to all the faculty here. We're happy that the uh, fellows could join us. Um, we have uh, the second part of the program and I will let Elizabeth um, I talked to you a little bit about that. Uh, this ends my two years as chair of the residence uh, symposium. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Uh, Betsy Dexter will be taking on as chair and I'm sure we'll take the program to even greater heights. Uh, it's been a privilege. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. <laughs>